Thank you for attending our webinar on understanding the eviction process. My name is Aditi Shakarwar, and I work as a field representative for Assemblymember Bloom. Uh, I will be moderating, moderating the event this evening. And some housekeeping items. The first portion of the event will be in webinar style. This means that only the presenters can turn on their cameras and microphones. So if you have questions, you can use the Q&A box, and we will do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Uh, for the second part of the webinar, we will be splitting up into three different Zoom meetings, uh, and we'll go instructions for uh, we'll go over instructions for that a little later in the meeting. Um, and each we're going to be having Zoom rooms for um, the city of Los Angeles, the city of Santa Monica, and the city of West Hollywood. So if you have any city specific questions, uh, I encourage you to wait until the second portion of the webinar. Um, and so with that, I'm now going to turn it over to Assembly Member Bloom, who's going to give us some welcome remarks. Thank you, Aditi. And good evening uh, to all of you. Uh, uh, judging by the numbers of people who are already participating, um, it, it confirms our belief that this would be a heavily attended event and that this is a topic of intense interest. So good evening and thank you for attending our webinar on understanding the eviction process. It, of course, has been a very tumultuous three years since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. And while many things feel as if they've gone back to normal, we know that uh, there are a lot of folks who are still struggling to pay rent. And as COVID-19 eviction protections change and come to an end, it can be confusing to understand what the current tenant protections are. And our goal today is to help you keep your family in your home by understanding your rights as a tenant. We want to empower you and your family uh, uh, with the knowledge that you need to fight an eviction notice in court. I want to make sure that we thank our presenters here today, joining us from Legal Aid, our Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles, the Tenant Power Toolkit, the City of Santa Monica, the City of West Hollywood, and the Los Angeles Housing Department. It's my great pleasure now to hand things off to Denise McGranahan and Romy Ganshaw from the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles. Thank you all again for attending. Thank you for that warm welcome. And um, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. My name is Romy Ganshaw. I am an attorney at the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles, and I am uh, joined by my colleague Denise McGranahan, who is also an attorney at Lafla Santa Monica office. See, my Zoom background is <laughs> rotated backwards, but um, Lafla has offices in Santa Monica and throughout LA County. Um, so Denise and I are both attorneys in our Santa Monica office, but we do have attorneys uh, countywide to help tenants who are facing evictions or other problems with their landlords. Um, just a moment, please. Sorry, just a moment. So what we're here to do tonight is give uh, understand an understanding of how the overview of, uh, of how the eviction process works. So first we're going to do a very um, general overview of how the eviction process works. We're also going to do a general overview of how rent control and just cause laws work because those might, those might impact how the eviction process could play out in your situation. Then we're also going to give a brief overview of some of the current state and countywide COVID-19 eviction protections as they exist right now. And we're also going to talk about how you can get legal help if you are facing an eviction or having problems with your landlord. So first, the overview of the eviction process. Um, one of the big things we want to drive home and make very clear is that a tenant cannot be evicted without uh, a landlord obtaining a court order. So this means that it's illegal and there are penalties, potentially even criminal penalties, for a landlord who um, tries to illegally lock out or force a tenant out without having gone through the legal eviction process and without obtaining a court order. So this means the landlord can't change the locks on you. They can't shut off the utilities. They can't threaten you to leave. They have to go through the legal eviction process. Um, 
And one thing some people don't realize is that if you are a subtenant and you're renting from somebody else who is um, the tenant and has a lease with the owner, if you're a subtenant renting under that other tenant, the, the master tenant that you're renting from actually steps into the shoes of a landlord. So that means that the master tenant also cannot use um, self-help. They can't go through, they can't try to force you out through illegal means. They also have to go through the formal legal eviction process in order to evict you in most cases. So this is a kind of very general overview of the steps in the legal eviction process. Um, so up at the top, um, you'll see that almost, almost every legal eviction starts with a written notice from the landlord to the tenant. So that's generally, um, it's something that must be in writing and it provides some basic information to the tenant about what the reasons are that the landlord has for trying to evict the tenant. And like I said, pretty much all evictions have to start with some sort of a written notice. After the notice stage, the landlord can file an eviction lawsuit in court. That's called an unlawful detainer case they would file a summons and complaint, and that's the start of the formal court process of the eviction. After the landlord files the summons and complaint, the tenant, they have to give that to the tenant. And once the tenant gets the summons and complaint, they have only five business days to file uh, a response, um, which is typically what we call an answer. So it's really important to know that if you get an unlawful detainer summons and complaint, you have not very long to respond to that. Um, and you should try to seek legal help as soon as possible because you really only have five business days to file some sort of a response in court. If you file a response or what we call an answer, which is the most typical response, you're sort of in the world on the left side of this screen here where you've asserted that I wanna be a part of this lawsuit, I wanna defend myself and you have the opportunity to do that. Um, of course, unlawful detainer or eviction cases are similar to most lawsuits in the sense that in, in not in every respect, in a lot of ways they're different, but they are similar in this one way, which is that the majority of unlawful detainer cases, like the majority of other cases, end up settling, uh, resolving in some sort of a settlement. And a settlement is really just any kind of an agreement that both sides can come to. So if both sides can agree for the tenant to stay, that's that can be a settlement. Um, it may be that both sides want to agree for the tenant to move out, but perhaps you might be able to agree that the tenant has a little more time to move out, or maybe they'd even get a little bit of money to move out, or there might be some other conditions on um, ensuring that the tenant has sort of a softer landing if they're going to move out um, than just being forcibly evicted. Um, but if, the, if you can't resolve the case through a settlement, um, then the case would go to a trial. And at the trial, the landlord puts on their case they have to establish that they have a valid reason for evicting the tenant in most cases, or in many cases, or that they've complied with all the requirements. Um, and if they can prove their case and the tenant has no defenses to that case, then the landlord would get a judgment, um, a judgment of possession, which means they have the right to come and, and get back possession of the apartment. Um, they can only do that by having the sheriff come to perform the lockout, but they would have the right to have the sheriff come do that. If at the trial the landlord can't prove their case or the tenant establishes that they have a valid defense to the landlord's case, then the tenant would win and they get to stay. Now, if the tenant doesn't file an answer or a response to the unlawful detainer summons within those five business days, then the landlord can get what's called a default judgment. And in that case, we're sort of on the right side of the screen here, where the red zone, this is the danger zone, so that happens when the tenant fails to uh, file a timely response to the lawsuit. The landlord can simply ask the court to win, have them win by default. Um, you kind of waive your right to defend yourself in the case and the landlord will still get their judgment of possession. So in that case, the tenant might still be forced to move as well. The sheriff would come to perform the lockout. Um, sometimes people ask how long this whole process takes and it can really vary. But one good thing to know is that these cases move much more quickly than normal um, lawsuits that you might be familiar with. So um, on, the, on the sort of short end, if the tenant does file a response and wants to participate in the lawsuit, the landlord is generally in control of when the trial happens. And it can happen within as few as three weeks after the tenant files um, their answer. But it doesn't always happen that fast. In fact, there's usually at least a little bit longer than that, but it's really hard to say. Sometimes it can, it can go quite quickly. Sometimes it can take longer. Um, if the tenant doesn't file a response, again, the landlord can get that default judgment. 
um, usually not too long after that five day window has closed. And then um, within a few weeks, usually, if, or maybe even a few days of after having gotten their judgment, they can move forward with having the sheriff come out to, to perform the eviction. So I mentioned that most evictions start with some sort of written notice. This is an overview of what the most common notices are. Um, one is a three day notice to pay rent or quit. This is when the landlord's claiming that you didn't pay some rent. It must be used to, it can only be used if you haven't paid rent. It's not typically supposed to be used if you haven't paid something like a late fee or a parking fee. Um, and it gives you three business days to pay any unpaid rent that's due from the last 12 months. If you owe rent that's older than 12 months old, you might still owe it, but the landlord generally can't evict you for it. Another type of notice is a three-day notice to cure or quit. This is if the landlord's claiming that you're violating your lease in some other way, like maybe you have pets and your landlord, your lease says you can't, or you're having someone sublet from you and your lease says you can't. In those sorts of situations, the landlord has to give you what's called a three-day notice to cure or quit, telling you to stop doing that thing, um, or else they would move forward with the eviction, with filing an eviction lawsuit. Um, and in some places, depending on maybe which rent control law might apply to you, um, the landlord might have to actually give you a warning notice before they could give a three-day notice to cure or quit. There's also what's called a three-day notice to quit, which is given when a landlord um, claims that you're causing some sort of a nuisance or major disturbance or you're bothering people or doing something that's really a problem for the neighbors or the landlord. Um, and also in, in some places, Santa Monica specifically, uh, even the landlord might also have to give you a warning notice before they give you a three-day notice to quit uh, for a nuisance. And finally, um, one other common notice that people see is a 30, 60, or 90-day notice. This is given when the tenant is not at fault for any reason necessarily, but uh, the landlord is wants the tenant to move out. Um, this is often given if the lease has terminated and the landlord says, okay, it's, lease is over, it's time for you to move. And it's good to know that if you live in a rent control jurisdiction, which we'll talk about, that's generally not going to be a valid notice in a rent control jurisdiction, um, in, except for in, in limited, uh, with some limited exceptions. But um, a 30, 60, or 90 day notice is, is one that generally is not based on something the tenant did wrong. So I mentioned um, that after a judgment, a case ends in a judgment, either at trial or a default judgment, the landlord can have the sheriff come perform a lockout. So that usually happens sometime, maybe a couple, a few weeks after um, the landlord obtains the judgment. It might be shorter than that. But the sheriff would come out to the house, post a notice on your door, um, and the notice has to give you at least five days notice of when the sheriff's going to come back to perform the, the formal lockout, which would be the, the, the formal eviction. Um, sometimes we hear from clients who this is the first time they've ever heard that there was an eviction case against them was when the sheriff came to perform the lockout or I'm sorry, when the sheriff posted the notice. Um, and that happens because sometimes people just never got served with the lawsuit. They didn't know about it and their landlord got a default judgment. Um, and if that happens to you, you should absolutely try to seek legal assistance as soon as possible. We're going to give information on how to do that because um, time is really of the essence. It's, in some cases, it's it's possible to undo this if you knew nothing about it, um, but you really need to seek help as soon as you can. And now I'm going to turn this over to Denise, who's going to talk about some of um, the other rules. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Romy, for um, that great overview. So we start, um, most of the, of the tenants that live in this area that are, you know, in, in Assembly Member Bloom's um, district are covered by some type of rent control or just cause protections. And often these are really good defenses to eviction cases. And so it's really important to know if you are in a jurisdiction that has rent control and or just cause. Now rent control limits the amount of rent that the landlord can charge each year. And um, just cause protections pretty much mean that the landlord can't just kick you out because your lease is over or because he just wants to. He has to have a good reason. And there are various types of just causes which will go over. With respect to the rent increases, right now rent increases are, have, are somewhat problematic because um, the CPI is so loud, is so high, and there's just a lot. You know, we had we're going to have a ten percent increase under the Tenant Protection Act, which is a statewide limit for Los Angeles County for those who are not covered by local local rent control. 
And we had recent issues with a 6% increase in Santa Monica, which has now been reduced to 3%. So knowing what, your, what the percentage increase is, is really critical. In addition, we have something called the Penal Code 396, which because there's a state of an emergency, no rent can go over 10%. So it's important to know that. So the cities that we typically think about and, you know, for people who are on this webinar would be Los Angeles, Santa Monica, West Hollywood, Beverly Hills, unincorporated Los Angeles, and then people, you know, the catch-all would be the State Tenant Protection, um, Tenant Protection Act. Um, and most, for the most part, rent control does not apply to single family homes or newer housing and single family homes include condos. There are, um, on the, under the Tenant Protection Act, there's an exemption that has to be provided by the landlord. If the landlord is an individual, not like a corporation that owns a single family home or um, a condo, they may be exempt, but they may not be. So, you know, it's gonna depend. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're talking about just causes. What are the types of just causes? Each jurisdiction is a little bit different. Um, you know, the common ones are non-payment of rent, breach of lease, um, nuisance, substantial damage, refusing to allow the landlord entry, um, not signing a new lease after one is expired on the same terms, um, being a subtenant who's holding over after the master tenant left and who isn't authorized, um, and other such um, reasons. Then there are some uh, other no fault causes like when the owner wants to move in or there is an Ellis Act eviction. Right now we're not having those types of evictions because of, um, because of COVID, but that's going to change in the near future. So um, it's important to know that you have protections because you can assert that in your answer, all right, when you're, when you're being evicted. Um, so next slide, please. We, oh, we also have, before we get there, we also have um, just cause um, requirements in some places, even when there isn't rent control. So for newer housing built after say 1978 in Santa Monica, um, you know, for multifamily housing, you still need a just cause for eviction. And, uh, and for even other jurisdictions, you know, there could be a just cause ordinance that covers post 1996 units if the 1996 date is when like newer rent control laws might might cover properties up to 1996, but older laws would like Santa Monica and Los Angeles are around 78, 79. So you really need to know what your protections are. Uh, so those are basically what what rent control um, provides and just cause. And if you get a notice or a summons or a notice from the court, usually the court will send you a um, notice of unlawful detainer filing. And sometimes people think they're getting junk mail, but that's a pretty important piece of paper. And what we tell people is, if you get that piece of paper and you don't get served by a process server within about a week or so, um, you should absolutely um, go to the court and get a copy of those papers and then go seek legal advice. And you should contact Stay Housed LA. And this is the um, website and the phone number. And if you do that, you will get directed to a legal aid agency based on your, your income and your, lo your ge geography where you're located and get some legal assistance. The sooner you get to, um, you contact Stay House LA, the more likely it is that you're gonna get broader scope representation. So if we have a client that comes in with a notice and we can start there, that's more likely we can we can be we can represent the person in court. But if they come the day before trial or the week before trial, it's much harder for us to have the resources and the ability to do that. So if you are in that situation, the sooner you get to us, the better. So um, so that's where you go. I want to also talk a little bit about the current state and county COVID eviction protections. Now, ever since um, March of 2020, you know there's there have been various iterations of protections. And depending on when, um, what period of time we're in, your protections are going to differ. So um, for the most of them have expired, most of the local juris jurisdictions um, moratoria have expired or been rolled back. Um, in Los Angeles County, and, and there is no like eviction more time, like I can't be evicted. There are very narrow circumstances under which you can't be evicted. But you can't actually, the landlord can actually bring an eviction case at this point, 
you might have an affirmative defense to that case. And that's really what we're talking about here. Next slide, please. So um, if you owed rent between March, 2020 and March, 2022, you're very likely got some rental assistance through either the city of LA or housing is key, the state program. And, I'm, and there are other local programs too, depending on where you live. Um, and people could get up to 18 months of rent relief for that period. And they had to apply by the end of March. You can't apply anymore. And if you, in your landlords were required to apply for this rent relief as a condition for trying to evict people for non-payment of rent for that period of time, or for the period from the, uh, I think October 1st through March, October 1st, 2021 through March, 2022, because prior to October 1st, 2021, there was this situation where you would pay a percentage of your rent, like 25%, and the rest would turn into, um, you know, uh, consumer debt. But between October 1st and March 20, October 1st, 2021 and March 31st, 2022, if your, your landlord would have to prove to the court that they applied for rent relief and that they were denied and so on. And so um, there are still people who are pending their rent relief, but there's an injunction against the state program that they can't deny people or um, turn down appeals um, at, at this point because there were problems found with the program. And so there are some people sort of stuck in this loop in court where they're just not getting resolved, but eventually they will. And until the landlord can get a true final denial, they can't evict you. But we had no protections for April, 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 May, and June, none at all in Los Angeles County. Um, so you could be evicted for that period of time. Now for July through November, let's say we're gonna start with July through November, there were, there were limited protections against eviction for non-payment in Los Angeles County. However, you have to certify that you couldn't pay the rent due to a COVID-19 financial impact and that you're at or below 80% of the area median income and you would have to submit a declaration within seven days of the date the rent was due, unless you had a good excuse. What is a good excuse? We don't really know. Not knowing about it, I, I'm not sure that not knowing about it is a good excuse. But certainly for some people, if they can prove the COVID relationship, that the impact, the impact was COVID related, and that would be mostly people who are suffering from things like long COVID. So the landlord could still file a UD, but the tenant would have an affirmative defense and the tenant carries a burden of proof. So if you don't have evidence of a COVID relationship, and if you go to the next slide, we have um, a recent definition from the county that came in yesterday. The uh, county supervisor approved this, some changes to this, uh, and I'll go into that in a minute. Basically, um, it's a 10% month uh, decrease in your monthly household income due to COVID or a 7.5% in your monthly household income cost. And I'm not sure you know, how many people can actually show that before COVID and after COVID or before COVID and presently they're in that situation. But if you feel that you can and you, you can submit a declaration for this period of time, but then again, you're gonna have to defend it and prove it in court. And some landlords we're finding are, are just, are kind of tired of COVID protections and are gonna just take their chances in court at this point. So we are recommending that people pay their rent if they absolutely can. Um, obviously, if there's no other choice, then they can try this declaration, but it's, it's not a, a, a for sure thing. Next slide, please. So, um, so the protections against eviction for no fault reasons, um, well, let me go back for a second. So the, all of the county protections are supposed to end at the end of December. With respect to non-payment, there was an injunction entered against the county so that um, unless the county fixed its law, it was going to not be in effect for December, the non-payment part. We, the county did pass um, a measure to uh, fix some of the problems that the court noted that were constitutional. And we're hoping that the court will accept that. But for right now, we don't know if December is gonna be covered for non-payment. So as a precaution, you know, pay the rent if you can. And if you can't, you know, just pay attention to the news and contact um, some advocates about it because I just don't know for sure. And I don't want people to be relying on that for December. Um, with respect to other protections, we have the current other protections for nuisance, unauthorized occupants or pets and no fault eviction reasons. Now, the, the county did just pass a provision 
yesterday that said, if you are somebody who relied on a COVID related non-payment uh, declaration since July, you could have another like another 12 months to, um, to not be subject to a no fault eviction. So for some people, they may have also further protection against no fault eviction in the next 12 months, but this just came about yesterday. And um, I don't know what, you know, I know a lot of people who did rely on these declarations. So that would be an added protection. But other than that, and other than whatever the city of LA offers, really very, very few protections are less are left for non for, for evictions and people should start assuming that they need to pay all the rent. Also don't know about very many places where you can get rental assistance. Some state and some of the local governments do have some funding. Um, so, and, and the LA County law applies to all the cities in unincorporated areas. Um, check you with your local, your cities, and hopefully in the breakout sessions, breakout sessions, you'll hear if there's any other protections that apply to you. So um, that is basically where we are. And if you need help, you can contact Stay Housed LA and follow us on social media. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Romy and Denise for that presentation. Uh, so we now we're going to have about 10 minutes for some Q&A. So I'm going to read out a couple of the questions that we've gotten here in the chat box. Uh, so the first question, um, I rent a non-RSO single family house in Los Angeles that is owned by a husband and wife. I have been notified that the landlord intends to evict me once the moratorium is over. When is the moratorium over? What are my options? I am paying rent well below market and would like to remain in my property. So, um, cause that was under my purview, I'll answer that. Um, it, it kind of depends on whether this individual has paid, um, has, has paid rent since July or, or utilized the declarations under the Los Angeles County moratorium. Uh, this is the city of Los Angeles? City um, it doesn't say, I, I think so. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, the, if the believe, question person would like to clarify, feel free. Um, but I think we can assume that it's the city of Los Okay, so I understand that the city of LA's protections end at the end of January. And it would be unlikely that anybody in that situation would have utilized the LA County moratorium declarations. So I think that we're talking about whenever the city of LA's moratorium ends, it ends. So they probably don't have any um, protection against a no-fault eviction beyond beyond that date, um, probably the end of January. And then if you go to the breakout session on LA City, you'll get more information. Do you have any anything to add, Romy, on that? No, I think that's right. The LA City breakout probably would be the, the place to discuss that. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question, can a tenant file a demure and motion to strike. So I can I can take that. Um, so that's yes, when a when an unlawful detainer case is filed, you have a variety of different ways to respond to the to the case. In many, many cases, the the response is called an answer. In other cases, it might be appropriate to file what's called a demur or motion to strike, which is a way to try to get the case dismissed early on, but it's not appropriate in all cases. Um, so I would just, again, seek legal assistance and the attorney or advocate who might be working with you will evaluate what is makes the most sense in your case. Sometimes there's not enough time to pull something like that together. But a demur is really a motion to dismiss because there's something about the notice itself or the complaint itself that is defective that on its face as a matter of law does not actually uh, state a cause of action for eviction for unlawful detainer or it's uncertain, it's very confusing. And yeah, it takes a lot longer to do those motions. So if you, you know, we, we do them, but we, we don't do them in every case. And, and when we do that, it's because there really is a problem. There are a lot of paralegal services out there, unfortunately, that lead people to think that they can get rid of their unlawful detainers by filing just demurs that are not, and they, they help them file demurs and, and that get denied because they're not meritorious, and you be, need to be really careful that you don't um, that you don't go to one of those um, those paralegals who pretends to be an attorney and takes your money, and then you end up getting evicted without really getting proper advice. So be careful about that. All right. 
Thank you. Um, another question from the audience. Just so we know how hard to negotiate. If this goes to trial, how long does the entire process typically take a landlord to evict someone who hasn't been paying? Also, after they finally get me out, can they come after me for unpaid rent? I'm asking in regards to Los Angeles City slash county. Um, so the process, as I mentioned, it can it can vary how long. If the landlord wants to be really quick about it, um, and you have filed some sort of a response, then the landlord can request a trial as soon as they get your response from you. And the court has to set a trial date within 20 days of when they get the response. So in theory, the trial, your trial date could be a month after you learn about a lawsuit if you file your response. Um, typically or very often, it does take a little bit longer than that. But if we're asking for what's the shortest period of time, it could be as short as a month you're going to trial. And if you lose a trial, then it's just a matter of however long it takes for the court and the sheriff and the landlord to kind of go through the paperwork of getting the sheriff to come out. Um, if you lose that trial and the case was about non-payment of rent, then the landlord will very often get a judgment of possession and a money judgment against you. So yes, they can try to enforce that money judgment against you for the unpaid rent that's still owed. Um, they would have to go through a process to try to collect that against you, but you might end up with a judgment on your record, which could harm your credit. Um, and so these are things to consider a lot of times. People want to avoid having a judgment on their record because it does damage their credit. It could also result in this eviction lawsuit becoming unsealed and becoming a public record, which can make it very hard to rent apartments in the future. Um, so these are all things to consider when you're negotiating. A lot of times what people really want is more time to move or to get some other plans in place. So it does help to know, well, what's the worst case scenario? How, how quickly could this go? Um, and the, the answer is it sometimes can move very quickly, but we are also, there's there's a fair amount of unknown still because the courts are still somewhat backlogged because of COVID. And the other thing to know is that if you do plan to move, um, sometimes if you give up possession before the case, well, if you give up possession before the case goes to trial, then um, the judge can't hear the case. It has to be put on the regular civil calendar. So there could still be a money judgment, a potential money judgment, but many times the landlords just don't bother with that if you give up possession early. So that's one thing. And we also, we, we help most, most of our clients settle, 99% of the case, I mean, most cases settle. We, we, we prepare for trial a lot of times, but we don't actually go. So a lot of times it's a question of like how much money um, like, will the landlord waive any rent in exchange for you moving and the more time you get, the less money you get and vice versa. So, you know, if, if, if that's even negotiable, not everybody negotiates that way. So um, it's important to get in quickly to see us and get advice quickly. As soon as you know that you aren't able to pay, depending on where you're at, there may be some resources available for you or some options that, that you might not think of especially in the city of Santa Monica. And so we, we want people to know early on they're gonna have a problem paying the rent to come to us at that point. All right, thank you. Um, we might have a, we have a lot of questions. So we're not gonna have, have time for all of them, but um, let's see. Um, so another question, my landlord received ERAS funds on my behalf to pay back rent. I have not been in arrear since the first year of the pandemic. I remember seeing something that said if she accepts the money, she can't evict me for any reason, at least till 2025. Can someone confirm or explain that? I don't believe that that's in, there is a contract that they sign, right, Remy? And that says there was a requirement as a part of the federal money that distributed the money to the state saying landlords shouldn't be taking this money and then turning around and evicting tenants, but it wasn't, didn't have language like they have to wait till 2025. It was sort of a, a guiding principle that unfortunately is not really being enforced. I mean, there, there is some contract with the um, housing is key program the landlord enters into where they agree to not evict for the rent that is being requested in that application, but I don't have the specific details here, but it's not no evictions till 2025, unfortunately. All right, let's see if we can get a couple more questions. So um, this question, I have received a 
secure covenant or quit. It's for a small amount for some utilities, $90 or so, but the landlord just made it so that there are no partial payments. So I'm being forced to either pay all the back rent I've deferred or be left where I can be evicted. So I would, I would encourage you to bring this notice to stay house delay as soon as possible. Um, it's, it's possible that the landlord is asking you to um, pay for some non-rent fees through one of these other types of notices, it, which may be valid if they're, it, it, these types of notices can be kind of complicated. Um, typically, if, if money is owed, if particularly rent is owed in the last 12 months, um, especially rent that's owed after, from April, 2022 onward, the landlord has the right to ask for it to be paid within three business days and they don't have to offer a repayment plan. Um, sometimes they will do that and they will agree to that, but they're not required to do that. Um, so unless you might be protected by the, the county protections that Lee, uh, Denise mentioned, um, you may be confronted with one of these notices, but I would encourage you to actually bring the notice or send the notice to stay house delay as soon as you can, because a lot of times there are like these kind of technical problems or defects in these things that might be a basis to prevent the eviction in this particular case. Maybe it would get you some time to get that money together because they might give you another notice that doesn't have these problems. Um, and in the meantime, you've gotten some time to get some money together. Uh, so we are at 540. I'm gonna pick just one more question. Um, this one I think will be a quick answer. So. Uh, in the city of LA, when the eviction moratorium ends, what happens to the unpaid rent during 2020 to 2021? I started to pay rent in 2022, but will the landlord come after me for the back rent? So the rent that was, um, so through September of 2021, if you paid, I think it was, if you paid 25%, the other 75% becomes consumer debt. Um, there's some other rules that really just depends on what period of time. So anything I think from October 1st forward, there were, were no such protections. So um, the landlord probably could, um, could, well, you can't evict for October 1st through March 20, March 31st, 2022, unless you got a denial from the housing ski or the rent relief program. So there's protections there. So really, I think for rent that was owed prior to that, it's most likely that they are not able to evict for it, but I would need to see the specific case and the time frame to be able to and look up the rules because they were just constantly changing over the last three years, and it's really hard to give a general answer. All right. Well, we have a lot of questions. I'm sorry that we didn't have time to get to, to all of them. Um, if folks want to get those questions answered, um, what's the best place for them to go after this webinar? Well, they if they have legal questions um, and they're seeking counsel and advice, they should contact Stayhouse LA and somebody from many, the number of organizations that work through that program will be able to get back to them with, to answer their questions if they, you know, if they're eligible for the services. And at that point, you know, they can even contact yeah. by phone or by email and you know, eventually just get, you know, it could be a five minute session. If it's a simple question or it could be, you know, a whole long case. It depends on what the person's situation is, but there is help out there for people and they need to know that, that that's the place to go and make an application. Stay Thank housed. you. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, for everyone who had a question that couldn't be answered today, and I know some of them were very specific to your specific scenario, definitely highly recommend that you call or email Stay Housed LA. Um, I can put that info in the chat in a, in a, in a few minutes. Um, so thank you so much to Romy and Denise for presenting uh, on that information. Uh, we're now going to transition over to uh, Renee Moya, who is going to be presenting on uh, a very useful tool called the Tenant Power Toolkit. Hi, Renee. Um, so he is going to, um, he's gonna give you all a rundown of this tool, and then we might have about three to five minutes for, for Q&A that'll be specific to the tool. Uh, so Renee, Feel free to, to go ahead. 
Thank you so much. And hi, everyone. Thank you for joining this important call today. Uh, again, I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Renee Moya. I'm an organizer, a tenant organizer with the Debt Collective, which is the nation's uh, first debtors union. And we have developed this thing called the Tenant Power Toolkit. Uh, I'm going to drop it in the chat, the link to it, which I think hopefully everyone will be able to see. Uh, the Tenant Power Toolkit uh, is an important, a very unique tool. Nothing like it exists in the country, but what it allows us to do, it allows tenants to do, is to be able to prepare uh, an answer to your eviction filing uh, from the court, the unlawful detainer uh, that I think a lot of folks on this call have been hearing a little bit about uh, tonight. I'll explain what that means in a second, but again, what the toolkit does is that it allows you to prepare an answer to that eviction that you receive from the court uh, from your landlord. In Los Angeles County, which is where everyone on this call uh, is uh, currently residing from or is from, uh, in Los Angeles County, we also allow tenants to electronically file the answer to uh, that eviction if the tenant qualifies for a fee waiver. Uh, and folks, of course, can uh, qualify for the fee waiver in one of a, a few ways. Um, if you do qualify for that automatic fee waiver, then you are able to file an answer to your eviction. Now, the reason why this is important, I think uh, we've had some, some panelists already talking about the eviction process. The reason why this toolkit is important is because in California, if you as a tenant do not respond to the eviction, that the eviction paperwork that you receive from the court within a five days of having received that eviction paperwork, then you could uh, face an, a default judgment entered against you. In other words, uh, you will automatically lose your eviction process or trial, um, and that will make the entire process of an eviction much, much faster. By re relying on and using the Tenant Power Toolkit, uh, we are basically giving tenants an opportunity to buy them time, to find them time, uh, find time to be able to get a lawyer uh, through Stay Housed LA, which again, we've uh, been hearing a little bit about today, uh, as well as to find uh, tenant organizers um, in your area, uh, tenant organizations that will allow you to, or be able to, uh, you know, fight back against your eviction. And so the Tenant Power Toolkit is important for all of that. I wanted to show you folks very quickly what the Tenant Power Toolkit looks like so that you know how to navigate it. Uh, and so I'm going to share my screen very briefly right now. And hopefully everyone can see me now. Uh, there you go. I think the folks, everyone can see the screen now. Uh, and so when you navigate to the website, tenantpowertoolkit.org, you then see this website that you're seeing right in front of you um, at the moment. This is the beginning of the Tenant Power Toolkit. I wanted to point out a couple of important things, though, for everyone to see, uh, given that, you know, we want to know how this works right properly. The first thing I'd want to note is that the 10 Power Toolkit is in English and in Spanish. Uh, if you are a Spanish speaker, see, usted habla español, uh, you're able to access the toolkit by clicking the button on the top right hand corner that says español. Uh, so I'm going to just click it right now and you see that the entire um, website changes into Spanish. If I click back to English, though, you come back to the, the website in English. There are some very important things I'd want to point out right now, though, for anyone who comes to this page uh, or to the Tenant Power Toolkit generally. Number one is that you see this button here that says Get Help, right, at the, at the top in the menu. When you click on the Get Help page, uh, it will send you to a website or a page within the website that allows you to find legal support uh, within LA County or outside of LA County, as well as a tenants union in your area. The point of this page is so that tenants who are responding to an eviction through the Tenant Power Toolkit, uh, that they can immediately then go and look for uh, legal and tenant support services uh, using uh, the information on this page. And so this is something that we like to point out to tenants when they're using it. Please look through that page, the Get Help page, uh, when doing it. The other thing that you see on the menu up here is our FAQs. Now, the FAQs are very important, are frequently asked questions. They're important because they uh, provide a lot of responses to or answers to the questions that tenants come to us with all the time about the toolkit. So, for example, some of the questions that you have answers to in here are, you know, how can I find 
free or low cost legal help in my area. And so again, we point people to stay housed LA within LA County, and we point uh, folks to legal service uh, providers, legal aid offices outside of LA uh, County in other parts of the, of the state. We do point out the fact that the toolkit is free. It's 100% free to use. However, something to bear in mind is though, even though the toolkit itself is free, it, you know, the, the fees for the court are not automatic, are not automatically waived. So again, there are, uh, you know, a, a fees associated with responding to an answer at the court, unless, of course, you qualify for a fee waiver. And of course, our toolkit allows you to apply for the fee waiver as well. So that's something I wanted to note, uh, to note for everyone. Again, other questions that you can get answers to here. If you're undocumented, can you use this tool? Yes, you can. Uh, if you uh, haven't yet received an eviction notice, this is an important thing for me to note uh, from the very start here, which is that our toolkit is meant to, to respond to the legal paperwork, the summons and complaint that you receive from the court. If you get a, a three-day notice from your landlord, a 30-day notice from your landlord, a 60-day notice from the landlord, any of those notices that are not the legal paperwork yet, we do not help you. We cannot help you, I should say, uh, be able to, to file a response for that. However, you can still go to our Get Help page and find the support, the assistance that you need so that you can actually try to prevent an eviction from happening, again, by applying for legal assistance and or by seeking out uh, tenant support, tenant organizations, tenants unions that can help you out. So again, the, the FAQs are very important. One final thing that would I would like to point out about the FAQs that are important is that while again, we do electronically file, we can electronically file answers for tenants who qualify for fee waivers. If you do not qualify for a fee waiver, then you will have to print out the documents yourself uh, and then walk them into court uh, yourself. And we do provide uh, a step-by-step -step guide uh, here for you to be able to actually do that on your own if you have to. Okay. I want to actually show you kind of the very beginning of what the of the of the toolkit itself, so you can see how it looks. Uh, I'm then gonna uh, stop and see if folks have any questions. But to get to access the actual toolkit itself, where you can start the response, you're gonna scroll down the page, and on the left hand side, you're gonna see this box on the left hand side that says, "I've been served eviction papers in California, and I want to fight my eviction." So if that means again you've received the court paperwork. You click the button that says start your defense, and then it will take you into the toolkit itself. Now, I'm not going to walk through the whole toolkit because the toolkit takes about 30 to 60 minutes to be able to complete. I know it sounds like a long time, but the difference between using this toolkit or finding a lawyer to file a response and not filing a response is the difference between losing your eviction immediately and not losing your eviction immediately. And so I really ask everyone to please take the time to properly go through this entire toolkit all the way through. If there are multiple people who are named on the unlawful detainer paperwork, which oftentimes happen, they will name all of the adults in the household, then we ask everyone to please complete the entire unlawful detainer process uh, on the toolkit, to complete the toolkit entirely for each individual person named on the uh, unlawful detainer on the summons and complaint from the court. That way we ensure that all of you can uh, have a proper answer filed for you with the court. Again, the first page that you see when you get to the toolkit is uh, asking you whether you speak English and Spanish, depending on what language uh, you require. A couple of other things that I wanna point out very quickly about um, what the, the website will look like is that at the top right-hand corner, as you can see here, it says sign in or sign up to save answers. We strongly encourage people to actually create an account with us the moment that you start the, the eviction uh, answer, only because your internet might cut out. You might lose power on your laptop. Uh, some other technical problem might, might come up or you run off to do something else. If you sign up to our account and all you need for that is an email address, and to create a password, that's it. Uh, then you're able to save your, your incomplete answer and come back to it when you have time. Although again, as a reminder, 
You have to file your answer within five days uh, of receiving your notice. The toolkit then also tells you kind of what part of the process that you're in. So you could probably see here that it says welcome, basic information, information from your documents, your defenses. This tells you what part of the process you're in when you're filing or preparing an answer. Uh, and so this is a nice, a nice way of letting you know how much time you still have left uh, through the process. We also provide in the middle or at the very bottom of every page, a listen to audio narration of the page. Uh, so this is an automated voice computer um, or, or a computerized voice system that reads what, whatever is on the website itself for those uh, folks who are either uh, learning impaired or hearing impaired, or rather, um, you know, cannot uh, read for whatever reason, whatever's on the screen, they can actually click on this and hear what is on the page. Uh, and then finally, again, we do once again, give you the opportunity to exit and save later at the bottom left-hand corner of uh, each page so that you can come back to the toolkit. I'm gonna stop there because I believe I'm now at time at my 10 minutes and I'm gonna open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Renee. Um, I don't know if I see any questions here that are specific to the Lieutenant Power Toolkit. Um, I'll give it like a minute. Um, there was one um, comment that said, uh, additional time isn't that helpful if we flat out don't have the money. Maybe that's something you can just uh, quickly touch on. Absolutely. And so it really does depend on the situation that each tenant is in. I do remind tenants that there are a host of protections, a host of defenses that tenants have to their eviction. I know uh, Romy and others can, can step in on that specific question, but I do like to say to folks that if you are facing terrible habitability conditions in your building, if you're facing discrimination, if the landlord did not properly serve you notice, if the landlord uh, did not um, you know, properly uh, you know, file some of the paperwork, there are a lot of defenses that you as a tenant have that you could possibly invoke uh, in service of or to be able to protect yourself in an eviction trial. Yes, I would argue, even in a situation of non-payment of rent, it's not a, a silver bullet by any stretch of the imagination, but the whole point of the toolkit, yes, is to buy you more time, number one. Number two, it also, and that, uh, it also gives you the opportunity, I should say, to be able to uh, find the support that you need so that you can continue to negotiate with your landlord in the event that you have to. That I think is extremely important for people. Uh, we always tell people that just because you respond to an eviction, it doesn't mean that you have to go all the way to trial and you have to, to face the consequences of what happens. You can still negotiate with your landlord to, to walk away, right? You can negotiate for more time. You can negotiate for an agreement. So the toolkit doesn't, doesn't actually cut you off in that process. It actually gives you a little bit more time to be able to do that. Um, should you think that you you need it as well. 